So definitely take some good notes. Um, so let's start. So let's go back a little bit to 500 BCE. Um, you know, Russia uh, initially is, is known as a region um, called Kivan Rus. And if you recall, Kivan Rus was kind of settled um, or, or, you know, the people that lived in that region were called Slavs, Slavic peoples. And eventually Vikings from North Northern Europe migrated there and there was obviously the, the, the mixture. Um, so Kivan Rus was, um, you know, really the, this region was just a region of city-states, right? And the, the largest and most important city-state at the time was Kiev, um, which today is the capital of the Ukraine. Um, and, and really it was not a very centralized state like the Roman Empire, right? The, the Roman Empire, um, you know, obviously existed in and around this region, um, the Byzantine Empire existed during this time, right? And so these city-states would pay tribute to a, a prince, right? Um, Vladimir the Great. Um, so, you know, just early background. Um, remember the Byzantine Empire, um, you know, uh, Vladimir would, would, would encourage, you know, missionaries or, or, or you know, the, 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 the exchange of religion. So, you know, Kivan Rus of this region becomes an Orthodox Christian region because of the Byzantine Empire's um, missionary work. Um, we know in 1240, uh, this region is overtaken by the Mongols, you know, right? These city-states are taken over. They're mostly allowed to govern themselves, but they just had to pay tribute. So it was indirect rule, right? Mongols didn't really want to settle there. Um, they, they wanted to live more nomadically. Um, Geography-wise, I think they were more comfortable living in, in Central Asia. Um, you know, the Russian princes were smart. They would um, skim off the top of that tribute, steal a little bit. And so they would fund their armies and build up their wealth. Eventually, the city-states came together. In 1380, the Mongols were defeated. Um, as a result, though, they did develop the Mongolian centralized government structure. Um, they became much more organized militarily. Um, but they were isolated during this time, and they kind of missed out on the Renaissance. Um, that occurred, um, you know, going going forward. Um, so even though they were trading with Europe, culturally they were not, um, you know, uh, exchanging those ideas um, that were emerging during the Renaissance. Um, but what that did do is it allowed this, you know, the Russian people to develop traditions and and um, kind of their own distinct culture. Um, and eventually a Russian state emerges. Um, so we mentioned they were influenced culturally by the Byzantine Empire. Eastern Orthodoxy was the religion. It united the people of Russia. Um, so that was important to kind of bringing them together. Um, eventually they'll centralize their government. We'll see that going forward. They'll have a, a very large bureaucracy and their rule, the rulers were known as czars. Sometimes you'll see it C-Z-A-R-S. Uh, they did believe in the idea of divine right. Uh, these rulers were um, tied into the Orthodox Church. They would use the church um, to justify their rule. And they did become wealthy from those tributes, so these skimming off the top. Uh, as far as trade goes, um, you know, uh, because of where Russia is located, they could trade with North America. Um, they could trade into East or Western Europe, um, into the Middle East. Uh, China. So um, they were not a central trade region, but it was easy for them to access the different parts of the world. Uh, they actually did engage in fur trade in North America. Um, they extended um, their empire into Siberia, which is very Eastern Asia. Um, so, you know, uh, they too probably exported uh, fur, but they also imported fur as well. Their main exports, though, were grain, definitely grain, leather, caviar, uh, and they were shipbuilders. Uh, you know, Russia was a very, um, you know, a dense forest region. So uh, that's kind of what you're seeing. I probably wouldn't worry too much about it, but um, they definitely were seeking out that fur trade in North America. That was important. Um, and, and, and later on in history, uh, Russia's going to want a little piece of North America, um, Alaska, Oregon territory. All right, um, the two major cities of, of, of the three major cities of the Russian Empire were Kiev, which today is the capital of the Ukraine, 
that would be somewhere, I'm not sure where, somewhere around here. Uh, Petersburg, right here. And Moscow. Moscow is the, the oldest city. Today that is the capital of Russia. Um, notice where St. Petersburg is. It's located on the water. So that's going to be a city that might be more modernized compared to Moscow. All right, so the first ruler that we're going to cover is Ivan III. Um, you know, not too much about him. Um, he is going to build the Kremlin, which is the kind of combining the capital and the White House in one place. Today, it obviously is where Putin would reside and work. Um, so he builds this kind of bureaucratic central, literally a central location for government. Um, the social classes were very important, are very important in the, this chapter. Um, at the top, you're going to have landowners, uh, the boyers. Same thing in Europe, right? The landowners were very powerful. Very often throughout this chapter, you're going to see how they had kind of tensions with the ruling class. Um, Ivan actually forced these landowners to, to move to Moscow, not give up their land, but perhaps, you know, um, uh, they would have their land, but they would have to live in Moscow so he could keep an eye on them. Remember, if you go back to Japanese history, the daimyo often fought um, with the, the shogun, right? And that was a problem. In Europe, at least in the early Middle Ages, the, very often the feudal lords were more powerful than the king. Um, these boyars did have to perform state service during Ivan III's rule. Uh, in the middle, you'd have your merchant class, and then at the bottom, you'd have peasants and serfs. Uh, so this was a feudal system, definitely. Uh, that's the Kremlin today. All right, Ivan IV, or Ivan the Terrible, uh, he was known for his expansionism and, and trade. Um, he expanded Russia into Siberia, uh, traded as far as Alaska, um, explored the Pacific, and throughout this time, we're going to see the spread of Orthodox Christianity to the New World, to, 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 to parts of America. Um, not extensive missionary work like the Spanish, but some Orthodox Christianity is going to emerge in the New World. He also established a secret police to kind of, again, keep, keep his eye on the boyars. Um, the Oprish Niana, that was very important to Stalin. Later on, we're going to learn about Joseph Stalin and how he used the secret police to kind of eliminate opponents. Um, so what I would remember for Ivan the Terrible would be the expansion. He continued the expansion of Russia, and that's going to continue throughout Peter and Catherine's rule as well. All right, so in 1600, after Ivan the Terrible moves on, we have a time of trouble. So from 1600 to about 1613, Russia was in a state of anarchy. However, in 1613, Michael Romanov would emerge as the new czar, and it would begin the, the, a, new, a dynasty in Russia known as the Romanov dynasty. Uh, throughout this dynasty, the rulers or czars would have basically be autocrats, um, you know, uh, single, singular rulers. Um, there might have been kind of a, a parliamentary or, a, 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 you know, a, um, a representative piece, but overall the, 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 the czar was the, the autocrat. He ruled authoritarily. authoritarily. Um, there was a lot of conflict, though, throughout this time. There were three groups of people all fighting for power. You had the church that, at least during the time of Ivan and the, and the prior rulers, were very powerful, very influential. Um, they were pushing to conserve Russian traditions going back to the time of Kiva Rus. Then you had the boyer class, the noble or landowning class that um, fought with the ruling class or the czar. So there was just kind of a power grab throughout this time. Um, that's going to change, though. In 18, 1682, uh, the next Romanov emerges, Peter the Great. Uh, he defeats his half-sister Sophia and her boyer supporters, and he establishes absolute control. He actually, um, you know, uh, uh, goes against the Orthodox Church. He didn't give up his Orthodox religion, but he tried to limit their influence and power. He eliminated the head of the church, or the patriarch, um, so he kind of governed the church. Um, definitely, you know, it's, theocr it's a theocratic government, no doubt. Um, but he wanted to limit the, the church's power. Uh, he changed the age to 50 to be a monk. That way he could have more young men for the military. Um, secular officials or his bureaucrats would choose the church leaders. So um, church leaders were not picking those positions of, you know, beneath them. Um, this was not supported by the peasant class who were more loyal to the church and the old believers, and that's going to be seen in your next DBQ, where there was going to be resistance to some of Peter's reforms, and mostly from the church leaders or those who support the church. He moves the capital uh, to St. Petersburg. Um, he kind of modernizes St. Petersburg. We'll, we'll read more about that. 
Um, why? Because he wants to watch over those boyers who are now performing state service. So he kind of, you know, if, if, if you're performing state service, you're in Moscow. Well, since he moves the capital to St. Petersburg, you know, he wants to now um, move them as well so he can watch them. Um, what he's most known for are his reforms, and that's what your DBQ is going to be about. You're going to basically detail and describe his reforms, um, political, cultural, and economic. So he's most known for bringing kind of Western Europe to Russia, whether it's adopting Western clothing, bringing in Western education, and Western industrial methods. So he wants to basically make Russia look like England, France, or Germany. Um, there are more rights for women under his rule. Uh, women could marry more freely, they could attend social events, and they could even remove their veil. Um, not a, not a, a big piece to this, but um, if you're writing an essay about you know um, women's rights and patriarchy, you know we see some some advances under Peter the Great's rule. Um, one thing that did not change would be the rights and opportunities for the peasants. Um, peasants during you know, Russian peasants had much fewer rights and opportunities than probably any other peasant group. Um, there was very little change or status. Um, in fact, serfdom increased under his rule. Um, serfs were taxed at higher rates. They were forced to work on state projects. And in 1774, um, at least uh, under not his rule, but under Catherine the Great's rule, there was eventually a peasant rebellion. So um, there were great improvements. Uh, increased wealth, but the lowest class still continued to struggle. And in, actually, they, they saw fewer rights and fewer opportunities. This is one of the peasant rebel leaders. Uh, so Catherine the Great follows in 1762. Um, she rules during the American Revolutionary period for context. She was not Orthodox, but she joins the church because she recognizes that that would legitimize her power, similar to what Constantine did with Christianity and Justinian, right? They're using religion to kind of, you know, um, uh, gain the, the, the respect and, and, um, of the people to, to um, again, justify their rule, right? Legitimize or strengthen their power by making this uh, union with the church. Um, she codifies laws, meaning she puts Russian laws in written form, right? Like Hammurabi or the Twelve Tables, right? So she too um, codifies law. She ends torture, so she's actually going to initiate laws that are fairly enlightened, right? Uh, she's not talking about, you know, equality or, or um, you know, she's not going to talk about dem democratic reforms per se, but she is going to basically try to um, improve the lives of Russians in some way. And mostly it was about cruel punishment, um, which, you know, is a part of our own constitution, right? One of the amendments. She was a, a believer in the Enlightenment. She communicated with some of the philosophers of Europe, um, and she embraced their ideas. So she, too, like, like, like Peter, wants to bring European ideas, or I say Western European ideas, to Eastern uh, Europe or Russia. Um, she tried to make peace with the boyers. Um, she didn't. She recognized that they were problematic, so she ex she actually exempted them from paying taxes, um, putting more pressure on the peasant class, and she did not make them perform state service. So there's a change here, right? Politically speaking, under Catherine the Great. Um, obviously, she joins with the church, um, and again, she um, exempts the boyers from from some of those um, pressures. Uh, what else? Uh, like Peter, she um, does not do much for the peasant class. In fact, she limits their influence even more so. She allows the boyers or landowners to control the peasant movement, and that does lead to a peasant rebellion under her rule. As time went on, she would become more, more despotic, so I wouldn't call her um, you know, a great example of, of a democratic ruler, but she is considered an enlightened despot in some, in some ways, right? mostly because of her attempts to end cruel punishment. She, like the other rulers, expands the empire. She adds land along the Black Sea to improve trade in the Russo-Turkish Wars. Um, the Ural Mountains and Caspian Sea land around that region is also um, acquired to protect farmlands. Um, where is that? Somewhere around here, I think. And then also um, with, with Prussia and um, with Germany, they carve out Poland, and she adds a piece of Poland to the Russian Empire. However, conflict with the Turkish um, or the Ottoman Turks, they would kind of take over the Byzantine Empire, 
uh, was expensive and costly, and obviously that's never good when you know, war is going to kind of destroy uh, an, an empire's treasury. Uh, domestically, she built a school for girls. So again, some change happening in Russia with women uh, to kind of prevent, you know, disease. She does initiate smallpox inoculations. Not really that important, um, but I would remember that she continues Peter's Westernization, right? Whether it's education or industry, that's going to continue on. Like Peter, there was pushback from more traditional Russians. It was a movement called Slavophilism, right? Slavic to kind of preserve Russian history and character. You know, there was this fear that whether it was French or British or German or Austrian, um, you know, ideas or things, they would come in and influence and maybe um, destroy some of the old traditions of Russia. All right, another important aspect of her rule was uh, she established a Jewish settlement, kind of a segregated Jewish society. Um, so in, in 1795, um, Poland was divided um, among the Russians, the Prussians, and Austrians. Prussia is just, um, you know, eventually it would be part of Germany, but Prussia was kind of the old Holy Roman Empire. Um, so that empire, the Frankish Empire, um, was was broken up into kind of German and Prussia. Anyway, bottom line is, um, by by taking a part of Poland, you're also increasing, or, or the the Russian the Russian Jewish population increased. Um, Russia had Jews, and now you're adding more Jews. Now, what's interesting is Polish Jews um, had some autonomy in Polish communities. They had important economic roles in business. Um, compared to Russian Jews who really were not independent and actually were more peasantry. They would work the, the boyer land, for example. So what she did actually is she forced all Jews to live in territory that was kind of carved out for them, called the Pale of Settlement. Basically, a Jewish state was almost created in Russia. Um, the old Jews and the new Jews were forced to live there. And what that's doing is it's developing or it's leading to anti-Semitism. Um, she's targeting them. They were never really well off, and now by segregating them, she's again isolating them, and that led to kind of anti-Jewish sentiment, which is called anti-Semitism, and even eventually attacks on Jews, which were known as pogroms. Um, if you go back to U.S. history, you know, in, this, in the late 1800s, um, Jews left Europe because of these, uh, sorry, Russia because of these pogroms. So these pogroms continued for literally a hundred years. Um, and obviously, later on in Germany, those pogroms would continue. All right, so um, Russian serfdom is probably the big piece that you want to remember. Like I mentioned, Russian serfs struggled more than, say, Western European serfs in the mid-Middle Ages or early Middle Ages in Japanese peasants. Uh, conditions were much harsher. Um, the demand for Russian grain was great, so landowners basically put these peasants to work, almost like slave labor. Um, they were taxed on top of all that. Um, many were put into debt. Many did lose land. Uh, they, might have, they might have had a small piece of land that they were given. Often they would lose that. So, you know, peasant could own land. They might, you know, work on um, a, a boyer's land, he might give them a small piece of land for themselves. So that, that's, you know, you're not going to see that a lot in Europe, but at least in Russia there was some land ownership. Not a big deal. Um, laws would force children of serfs to remain in serfdom. So there was a continuum, um, kind of a cycle of poverty in Russia. So I think that's definitely a unique feature where Russian serfs were much worse off than, again, Western serfs. Um, but by this time, really, you're not going to see serfdom in Western Europe. Things had changed. Um, you know, serfdom was kind of, you know, Russia was the last place of, 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 you know, the feudal system is is really only existing in Russia in the 1790s and early 1800s. All right, so eventually in 1774, we would see rebellion of peasants against Catherine. So out, out in the outer regions of Russia, you had these warriors called Cossack warriors. They were skilled fighters. They were influenced by the Mongols, and they would actually take in runaway Russian serfs. Um, so eventually, uh, a man named Yemelayan Pugachev, right here, he would lead a force of Cossacks and runaways um, into Russia to attack Catherine. Um, 
they were uh, defeated, um, and as a re result of that, there was an increase in oppression of Russian peasants, right, to kind of control them even further. Uh, by, 18, by the 1850s, a third of Russians were serfs. You're not seeing serfdom anywhere else in the world in the 1850s. All right, so the dogs are barking, so let me kind of redo that again. So we talked about this rebellion, um, these Cossack warriors who were, you know, they were kind of always battling, um, you know, Catherine. Uh, they were often mercenaries who were paid to sometimes fight other um, other regions. Uh, eventually, they, they, they take in Russian serfs, and they do eventually go back, and they kind of attack and fight with Catherine. Anyway, um couple things, you know, uh, again, by 1850, a third of Russians are serfs, so that's pretty pretty um, significant. At least during that time, you're not going to see serfdom anywhere else in the world. Um, and again, most nobles and merchants, they really didn't care because there was stability, um, you know, uh, politically. Uh, there was devotion to orthodoxy, uh, so there was unity, and Russia was becoming a military power. Um and, and that's really why, you, you know, the, the powers that be didn't seem to need to change things. Uh, that's going to change, though, um, because of war. So in 1853, there was a war known as the Crimean War, conflict between these Ottoman Turks, who we're going to learn more about, and the Russians over the Black Sea. Uh, England and France actually supported the Turks. Why? Because they were afraid that Russia was a threat. Um, you know, as Russia moved closer to the West, um, you know, the the... the the Western powers grew more concerned. Um, it was a defeat for Russia, and the people of Russia blamed serfdom. Uh, the, the fighters were peasants, and because of their lack of education, their poverty, they were not easy to train, they were not poor fighters, or they were poor fighters. So in 1861, eventually, Tsar Alexander um, ends serfdom with the Emancipation Act, and 23 million serfs are liberated, not that they're walking into mansions or good jobs, but um, they were no longer tied to that land. Uh, taxes were probably uh, less intensive. Uh, and this is part of a global trend. So in 1863, we know slavery is abolished in the United States. Uh, Brazil, uh, slavery is ultimately abolished, I believe, in 1888. And, you know, pretty much by 1900, you're not going to see um, serfdom or slavery anywhere in the world. Uh, at least, obviously, um, you know, not, you're going to have slavery, but uh, kind of, you know, on, on, on extreme intense levels. All right, well, that's it, guys. All right, thanks.